Four college students in their home after a Saturday night out in Moscow, Idaho. Four students who went to bed not knowing they were about to be murdered. Maddie, Kaylee, Zana, and Ethan all stabbed multiple times while sleeping in their beds. It's a crime that has terrorized this college town with many students leaving early for the holiday break and many not planning on returning until the killer is caught. It's a mystery that has tapped local police resources. So now the Idaho State Police and FBI have joined in this investigation. Forensic teams have been inside the home for days and are now scouring the outside of the home, looking for evidence, looking for answers, and looking to bring peace of mind back to the University of Idaho. But there are many questions still unanswered. Who called 911? How could a killer get into the house and escape that crime scene? What have the autopsies revealed? And is there any connection to reports of a skinned dog? Tonight, we are live at the crime scene, digging up the latest information and trying to answer these questions with our own panel of experts. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us here on Closing Arguments. Uh, the mystery continues tonight out of Moscow, Idaho. Four college students murdered last weekend. And the big question, obviously, for all of this right now is who did it? Who did it? It's, it's, and that's a loaded question because uh, there's a lot of steps to get to that point. There are so many other unanswered questions, but all of them as they get answered, will get us closer to answering this question, which is the one, number one, to get that answer for the families, to get some sense of justice and peace of mind for everyone else who's living in this usually safe and quiet college town. If my child was going to school there, I don't know if they'd be returning after Thanksgiving. Now, police have spoken. Um, they're looking for help. They're looking for help. They have asked the public uh, for video surveillance. They've put out information uh, just trying to jog people's memories or, 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 or put some relevance on certain times and places if people saw, heard, or noticed anything. And when police are looking for help, that tells me they don't have all the answers. You know, they're, they're, they won't tell us everything that they know. They won't tell us everything they're thinking. Uh, they won't tell us everything they suspect. But by asking for more help, more tips, more information, more potential evidence, it tells me they don't have all the answers yet. And they've called in for help from the public and the local police obviously overwhelmed by the situation on two fronts. One, the investigation. Two, the security of the campus and the students and the residents, um, not knowing who is responsible for this. Now, the, the chief spoke at a press conference yesterday and um, not saying much, not saying a whole lot. Um, a lot of the reporting leading up to this moment um, were things that we knew or had heard and he confirmed, which is important. It's very important. Like you hear that, okay, we're hearing reports that um, this was done or that was done or this was seen or this person said that. When the chief comes out and confirms it, um, that's important because, okay, now, now we can put more weight on that information. But it was a very guarded press conference where the chief obviously knew more than he could say, but really wanted to limit the amount of information that was being released. Uh, but he did take questions. And there was one reporter who asked the right question to get some information. That was Core TV's Chanley Painter in, in the middle of it all. And this is significant because 
Um, you know, they're not releasing a lot of things. A lot of these cases and investigations, um, depending on the jurisdiction, the status of the investigation, we will uh, get information, whether it's the public, the family, um, whomever. Uh, things like 911 calls. But in this case, we, we, we know they exist. We just don't know who made them or the circumstances under which they were made. And at the press conference, this issue came up. And Chanley Painter was asking uh, Chief Fry about it, trying to get some clarification on a really big issue, which is really the beginning of the investigation. Because in most of the, the crimes that we cover, the investigation begins after a 911 call. Take a listen to this exchange, because this was really the only new information that we learned at yesterday's press conference. Responded to the home. So, will you clarify that for me? You're not, you're not confirming a roommate called 911, but used the roommate's phone. So, was there someone else at the home other than those two roommates? There was other friends that had arrived um, at the location. How many? How many? And about the call. Honestly, I'm not quite sure at this time. To be quite honest. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter joining us live from the crime scene in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, Chanley, great to see you tonight. Um, let's talk about the 911 call. Uh, that's where this whole investigation begins, so let's begin there tonight. Um, what do we know about this call? Well, we just learned yesterday at that press conference, more people were in this home. Besides those two roommates we've heard about, the police have confirmed they were at the home, but there was a lot of confusion about who called 911 because they wouldn't say it was a roommate, but we learned it was from a roommate's phone that that 911 was called, uh, was placed, and the call came from this home inside the residence. And so we were able to glean from that uh, police chief that more people were there. After the press conference, they sent another press release out to the media. Attempting to clarify it some more, here's what it said. In part, it said on the morning of November 13th, their surviving roommates summoned friends to the residence because they believed one of the second floor victims had passed out and was not waking up. At 11.58 a.m., a 911 call requested aid for an unconscious person. It goes on to say that multiple people talked to the 911 dispatcher on that phone, which drew a lot more questions, even though they tried to clarify, it became a little bit more confusing as to why those roommates would call friends before calling 911. Well, I actually sat down in an interview with the PIO of the Idaho State Police today, Aaron Snell, and this is what he said about that. Does it concern you that they called friends before calling 911? So, you know, I think really um, we have to take a step back, right? And again, talking about going down um, a hole, rabbit hole, not looking at the criteria, uh, it initially came in as a medical call. So, um, you know, based on that, the roommates believed apparently that, you know, the uh, roommate, you know, there was some sort of medical emergency. So that's, so that's what the initial call came in. You know, when the officers arrived, obviously that changed. And so, um, you know, if we try and, if we try and pick what we want to, what we want to look at, then I think we'll miss, we'll miss the other information. Interesting point. He goes on. I ask him, are you worried about contaminating the scene? Uh, he says he has his faith and trust in his uh, uh, crime scene investigators, those that responded to the scene to make sure that that will not happen. So let's 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 try to paint the picture here and the, the timeline of this. It's still not 100 percent clear. And obviously that might be on purpose by them. But um, there's other people there when that call for medical assistance is made. Is it clear the circumstances under which the friends showed up? Did they show up knowing there was a problem or did they show up just because they were showing up? Like maybe the girls mm -hmm. downstairs or the young women downstairs woke up and called their friends said, hey, what do you want to do today? Or they just showed up because they mm -hmm. show up um, on Sunday maybe to go to breakfast, brunch, whatever. Is that part clear yet? Right. 
that part's not clear. And the only thing that we know is this, what they said in this press release, that they summoned friends because they believed one of the second floor victims had passed out. So it sounds like based on this that they called friends to help them with this the second floor victim who they thought had passed out Vinny uh, but that's all we're getting as of right now that yeah that's 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 there's a lot to unpack here all right Chanley Painter's with us folks and we're doing this uh, all night for the for the next two hours plus our breaking news out of Georgia uh, let's let me bring in my guests uh, to join this conversation in Columbia South Carolina retired medical examiner forensic pathologist former law enforcement officer Dr. Michelle Dupree is with us in Salt Lake City Utah private investigator Jason Jensen and in Los Angeles California forensic psychiatrist trial expert witness and columnist of inside the criminal mind Dr. Carol Lieberman great to see everyone Dr. Dupree let me start with you first um, it seems that the friends the roommates didn't necessarily realize what was going on here that maybe their roommate had been passed out which in college uh, kind of common but it takes me to a different place what what do you think it could potentially look like would there is it possible that it wouldn't be obvious someone was stabbed to death multiple times would the blood go in a place where it wasn't so obvious that someone was in distress from being stabbed to death Oh, very, very good questions, Vinny. And yes, I think that's um, it's a yes to both of those questions. Stabbing is very up close and personal. And if these people were caught off guard, perhaps they were asleep, um, at least some of them were asleep, um, they wouldn't make noise. Um, there, it was a three-story house. So it would not be uncommon, I think, to imagine that they did not hear anything. But how about and the blood? They wake up in the morning and they go upstairs and they see someone passed out. You're looking at someone who's passed out. It wouldn't be obvious that they've been stabbed to death. Is it possible that it wouldn't be a, a bloody scene? It probably was a bloody scene, but it may have not been a bloody scene right where that person was. If they were stabbed um, in a bed, for example, the bed would absorb most of it. Um, if they were face down, um, again, they may not um, see that blood. Um, and again, it's not something that you expect. The most common thing you expect is that someone's probably just passed out. And so not seeing the blood, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, are, are you surprised? Uh, someone wakes up in the morning, you don't expect to find your roommate stabbed to death or four of your roommates stabbed to death, especially since you slept through the night and you didn't hear anything. Um, is it possible that they, they wouldn't perceive what was actually in front of them? I think there is something fishy with those two survivors. First of all, um, they were ap apparently on the first floor and these the, um, the attacker or attackers um, went up to the second and third floor. And so in other words, they would have had to have passed the rooms where- Well, the, not necessarily, uh, depends where you enter. It's, it's, a, it's a strange house. There's well, a sliding door on that second level that we're gonna talk about more tonight, but- Yes, okay. But the police um, people have been describing this as incredibly the the worst bloody or the bloodiest scene that I've ever seen. You know, they've been describing this um, the the scene of the four people, four victims, as being so bloody. So it doesn't really make sense to me that um, that this person would have thought that the person was just unconscious. And even if they did, why do you call your friends instead of calling for medical help, calling 911 right away? Jason Jensen, uh, your thoughts about this issue, because this is, this is significant. This is where the investigation actually begins with this first, first call and the first person to, first people to notice uh, the victims of the case. Right, right. Well, I've seen plenty of cases where there was an anterior injury where they then landed on their back and so they bled into their chest cavity rather than externally. So if... If the body was lying in that scenario, then it's entirely possible that they didn't see a large volume of blood and assumed that they were laying in the hallway like they passed out. So unless we know the exact situation of the victim, how they were you know, laid out in the, in the scene, we can just assume there's nothing too nefarious about that. There's something that did not trigger a response to law enforcement about that. Otherwise, they would have investigated the roommates a little bit more thoroughly or the friends. 
I think it just happened to be one where these are untrained college students and they didn't realize what they were looking at when they saw somebody non-responsive to some kind of, you know, attempts to wake them up. Okay, guests are staying with us the, uh, this entire hour. And uh, when we come back, Chanley Painter, again, live in Idaho, is going to take us around the home. How could someone, the killer, get in and escape uh, from this scene? And what are the different ways? Where could they park a car? Where could they walk in? Uh, we'll take a look at that uh, very closely. Plus, coming up next hour. <laughs> In Moscow, Idaho, the search for a killer continues as the state and local police join forces with the FBI to continue to search for who is responsible for the horrific stabbing murders of four University of Idaho students. Tonight, we are asking the important questions. What is the timeline? On the evening of November 12th, Ethan and Zana attended a party here at the Sigma Chi fraternity home. At 10 p.m. on the other side of campus, Kaylee and Maddie are seen together here at the Corner Club in downtown Moscow. 0095. Hello. Anything, How are you? Anything, anything you could update? Why'd you block off more of the road, by the way? Just uh, look at a little more area, thoroughness. There's a look at some of the investigators at the scene of the murder of the four college students in Moscow, Idaho. Still with us at the scene, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who has been there on the ground speaking to everyone who will talk. Um, uh, Chanley, what's the, what's new? What sort of information? I will you... chase them down the road. A exactly. <laughs> what sort of information did you uh, find out today? Well, as soon as I arrived to the, the home here, I noticed there they expanded this crime scene to an area you and I have been talking extensively about, Vinny, and that's what's behind this home, this three-level home. There's a parking lot adjacent to a an apartment building that you could pull up and park, and you can see directly to the back of this house. Well, they expanded that crime scene tape right there to block off that portion of this back parking lot, and they spent um, a lot of the day, the investigators, that team that you just saw on my cell phone video, uh, exploring this parking lot area, the grassy area, and the hill that leads down into the backyard and towards that glass a sliding door into the home. They would actually kind of uh, shuffle with their feet through the grass. They would kneel down and just stare in the direction of the home. They would point in the direction of the home. And at one point they were seen uh, walking and then running up and down the hill, like what path would be easier access. Uh, it was really interesting to see. And I, uh, of course, asked, then they said they were just trying to broaden the scene. I also asked the uh, Idaho State Police uh, Communications Director, Aaron Snell, about it. He said that they're just trying to look at things from a different perspective and see if what they find in that area matches and, or confirms what they already sort of know. But tight-lipped as far as if they found anything or if they just wanted to keep us a little bit out of their way, Vinny. Well, let, let's do this. If you can, because I know you're out there all day long and you're looking at this thing from all different angles. Um, you're on the ground there. Can you sort of take us for a tour of the area around the house so we could have a better understanding of how someone could get into the house and get out of this uh, crime scene. Absolutely. Well, of course, it's dark now, as you can see, but earlier today, we took some key uh, video around the home. We're going to start uh, with what's to my immediate right. There's a two-building apartment complex, and it's just steps, you know, a couple steps uh, from this home. And again, like I've told you, we're on a dead-end street. The street comes in front of this home and then around this apartment complex parking area and then back out to a main road. So here's what it looks like from our camera. So if you're standing at this apartment complex, maybe at the window of the first neighbor here to my right, this is what you kind of can see of the home. You can see there's lots of cars parked there because uh, media here, but you can see the entire side of the home up close. Now, if you move to kind of back towards the front of the home to my left side, we're surrounded by multi-level, multi-residence type homes in this area. And we also took a view from that angle as well. So there's a blue house 
highlighted there on the map, as you can see. And then we also have the video of if we're, our photographer stood there. Here's what you can see of the crime scene from that angle as well. You can see the blue house and it's towards the front. You see the victim's vehicles, the police cars, the windows on all three levels. Some don't have window coverings. And then another angle we wanted to show our viewers is around uh, the opposite side that we don't show a lot because there are houses that share kind of a yard. There's a fence that separates the yards of those houses highlighted in yellow to the backyard of the crime scene highlighted on this map. And our camera from that angle looked towards this crime scene. You can see a really good depiction of the three levels of this home. You can see how it's built into the side of the hill, how the second level would be where the glass sliding door window is right there, and then the third level as well. And the back, the very back, I mean, it's wooded. Uh, there's a house on up the hill with a fence as well, uh, with uh, lots of foliage around in the area. But virtually, if I wanted to, but for the crime seed tape, uh, walk in any direction except for the fenced in backyards of the houses to my left, I could really go any direction, especially if I had on some, you know, hiking boots, many. The, the fences, just to clarify what we just saw with the fencing there. Does the fence prevent you from getting to the house where the murders took place, or do the fences prevent you from getting into the backyard of the neighboring houses? Those are the fences for the neighboring house's backyard. The crime scene home does not have any fences. You can see where maybe there used to be a fence, but the only... Uh, you know, mark of, a, of the property line is that fence for the neighbor's house. There's no complete fence here around this home, Vinny. So you could walk all the way around it. Um, you just, it would prevent you from walking into the neighbor's private property. Okay, that, okay, that makes, that clarifies a lot for me. So th there are many ways to access this home. You don't just have to pull up in front and go in the front door. You could be parking at a neighbor. You could park behind it. You could park at the apartment complex next door. You could live in the apartment complex next door and easily make your way onto the property, onto that concrete slab. And if the sliding doors are open, you can go right into the apartment on the second floor. You certainly can, uh, Vinny, and I asked both the investigators here on the scene today because they were sort of charting out a path. Almost, I asked, have you determined a point of entry, how this person entered the home? And they told me no. They don't know how the person entered the home. And later, I confirmed that with Mr. Snell. Let's take a listen. You had previously reported no forced entry was noted in the home, the front door left open. Uh, was the glass sliding door unlocked by chance? What I can say is that it doesn't appear that there was any forced entry into this home on the night of the incident. So it could have been unlocked? Potentially. It could have been unlocked, Vinny. That's why no forced entry, and that's maybe why they've really been focusing on the back of this house. Wow. All right, let's bring back in our guests, get some reaction. Dr. Michelle Dupree, Jason Jensen, Dr. Carol Lieberman. Uh, Jason Jensen, I'll begin with you. Uh, it, it seems like from the what Chanley just showed us, there are many different places you could park or many different places you could come from and get into that house if that sliding door is opened. Uh, you don't even have to go to the front of the house where the front door is. Right, right. In fact, uh, you, if it was a neighbor, which oftentimes these cases are a neighbor, like a stalker, uh, they could have walked all the way down, you know, for a mile or more to get there. If they knew where they were going, if they knew what the routine of these uh, occupants were. So they could easily uh, walk through the sliding glass door on the back side because, you know, this is a multi-resident uh, building where oftentimes they don't lock in sleepy towns like Moscow, Idaho. Let me ask you, uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, a um, couple different ways, right? It could be someone who is stalking and waiting for the moment to pounce. Um, I, I, this doesn't strike me as a place where someone would randomly come across this house and say, oh, I think I'll just walk into this house. So the fact that they keep saying targeted, 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 uh, the more we explore, the more sense that makes to me that it, at a minimum, there was some target of this home. 
Yes. Now, one of the interesting things is that one of the girls, um, Kaylee, had posted on Instagram uh, a picture of the four of them. And she said, um, one lucky girl to be surrounded by these three people every day. Now, um, if if they were targeting her, you know, um, this would be a way to get to not only target her or to get back at her, but to kill all four of them. I don't know. That's just one uh, one extraneous or or one thought. I mean, there's so many different um, possibilities. They've already ruled out, however, the the driver that drove them to their home and their and I mean, they're ruling out. Another interesting aspect is um, calling Jack, the boyfriend, uh, the ex-boyfriend, who the families are saying could not have done anything. But, you know, it's interesting to wonder, the two girls called him um, just not that long before they were attacked. And so you wonder, was it because they they saw something, uh, somebody following them and they thought he could come help? Or did they think that he knew this person and he could talk to them and tell them not to, to, to hurt them? Um, these are two little bits that that seem like interesting paths to 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 follow absolutely all right um we've got more to get to tonight on the program number one we've got breaking news out of georgia we've got an arrest in the case uh involving a missing toddler quentin simon his mother arrested today julie janae will join us with all the details coming up at the top of the hour uh in the meantime we're still going to stay live in Idaho tonight uh, and talk about the autopsy results. Live from Idaho, don't go anywhere. Now. There were stab wounds on the hands of it, uh, at least one of the students that make it appear that it would be defensive wounds. That's the coroner describing some of the wounds of one of the victims in the University of Idaho a stabbing case. Four students murdered inside their off-campus home, but barely off-campus. I mean, campus is like one block away. Um, I want you to take a listen. This is Captain Lanier uh, here talking about the autopsies. We knew that the autopsies confirmed the identity of the four victims, determined the cause and manner of death as a homicide by stabbing, and determined that it was likely all four victims who were asleep during the attack. Some of the victims had defensive wounds, and each victim was stabbed multiple times. There was no sign of sexual assault. Not a lot of information, but some very important information when you're trying to profile who could have done this. Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent, still with us out in Moscow, uh, Idaho. Um, was there any indication from investigators about knowing or understanding the order in which the victims were killed, where they were located in the house precisely? Well, we know two were on the second floor, two were on the third floor, Vinny, and they aren't revealing the order or who or which of the four may have had defensive wounds. I tried to again follow up with the interview I had with the PIO of the Idaho State Police. He would not say, he said they're not revealing that information. He just said there was evidence from the coroner and the autopsy of defensive type of wounds. Uh, but, you know, I told you also this the house behind me, when we were here Friday night, you remember seeing flashes in certain rooms, Vinny, uh, on the second floor. It seems to be like there are two different rooms, well, the second floor where victims were located, and maybe one on the middle third floor window for the that. So I am assuming that the Kaylee and Maddie were on the second floor, and Ethan and Zana were on the third floor. But that's just me based on what I've been observing here. They won't officially say. Then that would make some sense if Ethan and uh, uh, Zana are a couple and the other two have their own rooms. Um, I want to bring Dr. Michelle Dupree back in, retired medical examiner. A couple of questions about what we've learned about all this. Um, how can you tell if they were asleep when they were murdered? Well, 
Is there any sort of medical way you would be able to determine that through autopsy? There's really not a way to tell medically whether they were asleep or not. The best way is to surmise that from the injuries themselves. The person who had or persons who had defensive wounds obviously would have been awake. If there were no defensive wounds, then it would be reasonable to suspect that they were asleep. Now, um, what do we, and, and this, is, this is tough. I, I know this is difficult information, but I think it's important because it, it, it's to understand how this could happen. Um, you're asleep, you get stabbed. Is someone going to make noise? Are they going to feel pain? And again, the, the um, statements are that each victim was stabbed multiple times. And that's an excellent question. The first stab wound will determine that. If the stab wound is in an essential location, um, directly in the heart, perhaps even in the lungs or in the neck, then that person may not make very much of a sound. The um, subsequent wounds then, of course, would, um, would, they would not make any sounds. Um, if they were stabbed in the arm or the leg first, then yes, you would expect them to make a sound and even to fight back. And in terms of pain, is there any way to ascertain um, and, you know, I'm sitting here hoping that if you're in your sleep that you're not going to feel that, but I don't know if that's true. No, just being asleep will not prevent you from feeling pain. Sharp force injuries are painful. Um, and again, depending on where that sharp force injury occurs, there'll be more or less pain. But there's definitely pain involved. Let's get back to the defensive wounds. Um, would the person have to be fully awake or could you kind of be a little groggy and you get that first stab wound that's not fatal and then your body sort of reacts before you're even conscious of what's really happening? Yes, that is absolutely entirely possible. Um, you may be groggy, you may be um, slowed reactions for several reasons. Um, and so yes, you could do that. And the other thing is, is that Again, this is very up close and personal. And so once that first stab wound happens, um, that person is likely to try and fight back if that was not a fatal wound to begin with. Dr. Carol Lieberman, let me ask you about something that Captain Lanier said. There was no sign of sexual assault. Should we still be looking at sex offenders in the area, even though mm -hmm. no one was apparently sexually assaulted in this attack? or what other type of person are we looking for? Well, um, you know, I wouldn't rule anyone out at this point, but, you know, one thing that is sort of obvious is that um, these four students would have, you know, they were, they, the, the girls were very attractive, uh, wholesome, the boy, you know, they were both, they were all um, very active in the school. They, you know, they, they were people that um, other students uh, or people who knew them or saw them could have been very jealous of them. And whether it's um, a, a spurned lover for one of the girls or whether it's just, you know, somebody who um, just, you know, an incel perhaps. Um, I don't think, I mean, it's good to know that there wasn't any sexual assault. That's one the parents and families can at least uh, be comforted by that. But I don't think that that necessarily rules somebody out other than um, that it was for a different motive than to sexually assault them. All right, Jason Jensen, I want you to take a look at what I'm putting on the screen right now. Um, this is from the Idaho Statesman report from uh, November 20th. Uh, Scott Jute, general manager of Moscow Building Supply, told the Idaho statement, statesman that police have visited the store more than once to ask whether the retailer sold anyone K-Bar brand knives, which are also known as K-Bar knives. They were specifically asking whether or not uh, we carry K-Bar style knives, which we do not, Jut said in an interview. If we did, we could have reviewed surveillance footage, but it wasn't something I could help them with. Jason Jensen, um, I, I think we have a, a picture of the type of knife that was being asked about. Um, do you know anything about these types of knives and who would have them, who would carry them, uh, who would normally use a knife like this? Well, oftentimes that kind of knife would be popular to survivalists, uh, ex-military. The reason why 
is they, they are an ideal uh, knife for self-defense or even to take an offense because they have the protective guard there that prevents your hand from sliding down onto the blade. So that would be one of the signs that they would look for if this was like a kitchen knife or something. They would look to see if the attacker cut himself. But if there's no blood from the assailant, they can safely assume it's going to be this type of a combat knife because they're designed in a way to prevent that self-injury in the course of using it for some kind of, you know, force, in this case, you know, to, to murder somebody. Um, Dr. Dupree, we only have a couple seconds here, though, but um, is there anything from the autopsy that would have investigators looking for a particular type of knife? Yes, you can look at the wound wound itself and tell whether it's a serrated knife or a straight edge knife and in this case this, it seems like it would be a straight edge knife all right guests are staying uh with us uh, when we come back some disturbing reports everyone's talking about um a case involving a skinned dog close to the scene of this slaughter those details next Everybody was there, and we had dinner. Next thing you know, the last two bullets went directly in my head. These are the stories. It was a crime of passion. Of the victim's kill. How could this have happened? By someone they knew. I really screwed up. Someone they knew with Tamron Hall. Thanksgiving Marathon begins Thanksgiving Day, 1110 Central, only on Court TV. to Healthcare. expediting the forensic testing of the items that have been seized? We're or? trying to expedite everything that might possibly lead to a suspect. That is Chanley Painter on the ground in Idaho speaking to everyone who will talk. Uh, meanwhile, a very disturbing report um, coming out of Moscow, Idaho. I mean, the quadruple murder, absolutely the worst of the worst, but now something else. Um, this is from the Daily Mail. Take, take a look, folks. Uh, meanwhile, local sleuths on Facebook have connected the killings to the story of a man who found his neighbor's dog skinned alive just two miles away from where they were last seen. On October 22nd, a man named Clint Hughes posted on Facebook that his neighbor's sweet little dog was skinned like a deer. No animal did this. Um, here's Aaron Snell, a police PIO, speaking with uh, uh, Chanley Painter about this. Apparently there's a report of a skinned animal, um, skinned dog, and so um, our detectives are aware of that, and that has been reviewed, and in no way, shape, or form do they believe at this time that that has any, um, any connection to this case at all. Okay, I, I don't know how you can say that if we don't know who was responsible, but anyway, let's bring in our special guest breaking all this news in Los Angeles, California, senior reporter for the DailyMail.com, Caitlin Becker is with us. Caitlin, great to see you. Um, so what, what's the story of this skinned dog and in terms of proximity to the murder scene and everything else that you've learned? So the, this dog was 12 years old. His name was Buddy. He was a mini Australian Shepherd, really a, a little dog. Nothing scary about this dog at all. This was about three, three to four weeks before the murders and roughly two to three miles away from the murders. This skinned dog was found. He belonged to an elderly couple who let him out to go to the bathroom at night and he never came back. As I said, the dog was old. They had him for five years. He never ran off. The family believes that he was picked up by someone and he was skinned. They called the sheriff. The sheriff came. The sheriff looked at the at the body of this dog and said very clearly it was done by a human being's hand. It was not an animal attack. And uh, I guess a lot of folks online, because there are thousands and thousands uh, talk, taking a look at this case, kind of putting the two things together, saying, hey, here's something to look at. And as we heard, detectives did get wind of it. 
Detectives are aware. Like I said, the sheriff was called out to investigate this before the quadruple homicide happens. And anyone in law enforcement, and really anyone who follows true crime, can tell you that there is a corollary between animal abuse and violent crimes. It is a gateway crime to harming individuals. And there is the statistics are really high for the amount of mass murderers and serial killers who abused and murdered animals earlier on in their life. So while we're sitting here having no idea who to look out for, it's only reasonable to kind of be scared of anyone. If there's pets and people being slaughtered in a small community, as you said in the beginning, it's kind of hard not to think those things are connected in some way. Absolutely. Caitlin Becker, uh, DailyMail.com, um, doing a great job. You guys are on top of this story. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's bring back in our experts. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, let me go to you on this. Uh, a skin dog may have absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, but I, I, I'm wondering why you would dismiss it so quickly. Yes, I don't think it should be dismissed so quickly. It's not like there's somebody else that they're, uh, you know, focusing on. Um, the there is a connection between abuse of animals, you know, in terms of the triad, a sociopathic triad. But in addition to that, it's some people try out their uh, killing first on an animal, and then they get emboldened to do it on a human. Jason Jensen, um, my guess is is that that case was investigated, but maybe not solved, and maybe you take a second look at it. Right, right. If I was the private investigator, usually oftentimes the private investigator is consulted to run an independent investigation adjacent to a police investigation. We would look to see if there was some kind of connection between the victims of the dog attack and the victims at, you know, at this crime so we would be looking to see if there is something more there before we just you know summarily dismiss it absolutely uh want to take this time to thank everyone for joining us uh, on this monday night dr michelle dupree jason jensen and dr carol learman your time is so valuable so we really appreciate it a great insight tonight and um we wish you the best for this uh holiday weekend coming up thank you so much when we come back folks top of the hour Big, big breaking news out of Georgia involving the disappearance and now murder of this little angel, Quentin Simon. Uh, we'll have a live report from Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae. Plus, we'll take you back to Idaho with Chanley Painter. Don't go 